It is Friday, April 13th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is Mr. Blake Odd, who is currently the news editor for Flagpole Magazine, Athens' Alt News Week Weekly, uh, where he pens the weekly City Dope column. Prior to his work for the Flagpole, Blake covered news, politics, and government for the Athens Banner Herald for several years. Uh, Blake split time growing up in Atlanta and Birmingham, and he attended and graduated from the University of Mississippi. A regular contributor to WUGA's Athens News Matters with Alexia Ridley, he is a well-sourced journalist and a quick wit, and he can always be found on various social media platforms. Thank you very much, Blake, for taking out some time uh, this Friday morning to talk My politics. Pleasure, thank you. Really do appreciate it. We'll be talking politics, state, local, national, otherwise. <laughs> So just to begin with, uh, I was wondering if you could tell me about your, your childhood, your upbringing. Uh, sure. Like you said, I grew up mainly in Atlanta and uh, Birmingham. We, um, I was actually born in Kentucky. We uh, moved around a little bit when I was a kid and moved to uh, Alpharetta in, um, I guess it would have been the late 80s. I think I was in third grade and then moved to Birmingham when I was in ninth grade. Went to high school in Birmingham, uh, went to college uh, at Ole Miss. So, so what what took you to Ole Miss instead of Alabama or, or, or UGA? Explain, uh, explain yourself, sir. <laughs> um, well, I just uh, I had visited Tuscaloosa um, in high school for a uh, for a journalism conference and was not impressed <laughs> with Tuscaloosa. Uh, my English class took a field trip to Oxford uh, when I was in high school, and I very much liked Oxford, so. Um, they had a good English department, a good journalism program, and it's it's a very literary town. It's sure, uh, it's, it's a really cool place for a writer. Um, I mean, not just Faulkner, but um, you know, uh, uh, Barry Hanna was my creative writing professor. You know, I mean, there are a lot of uh, a lot of big name writers. You know, Shelby Foote used to just hang out on the square. You know, <laughs> be walking down the street, see Shelby Foote sitting on a bench, That's and amazing. stuff like that. So you know, talking Larry about the Brown, Civil War, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it was very much for writers. It was very much like Athens is for musicians. So, yeah. So, d you know, did you grow up in a, a politically active or attuned or, or a, a writing family? What, what were your influences that, that got you to where you are today? Uh, well, I mean, we always, I mean, my family always read the newspaper, um, you know, and I guess it started with, um, you know, my dad read me the funny papers when I was a little <laughs> kid before I even learned how to read. But you know, then I started getting into sports and I started reading the sports section and then I started, you know, reading the rest of the paper. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say we were, a, you know, I mean, we talk politics a little bit in my household, but my parents were never really involved in politics at all. Um, but, you know, it was just something that piqued my interest. And, um, you know, I guess as we'll talk about later, I mean, it was, a, it was a time of, you know, when I was a teenager, there was a lot of change going on in the political world. So sure. it was interesting to me. Is that what, you know, you went into college, unlike a lot of people, you knew what you wanted to do in terms of English writing or journalism. Yeah. Why, why was that something that, 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 that grabbed you at such an early age, or, or at least an early stage in your life? <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, it's always, it's just something I have a knack for. And I mean, since I was a little kid, it's, you know, I'm not good at much, but that was one thing that I was good at, uh, and I enjoyed it, and it came easily to me, so it just seemed natural. And, you know, I'm just very, I'm very curious about a lot of things, and, you know, maybe not one thing in particular, but one thing I enjoy about journalism is you get to learn about a lot of different topics. Oh, sure. Um, you know, anything from, you know, I might be writing about some sort of, like, scientific study one day, and then the next day I'm writing about you know, highways. So <laughs> it's it's really interesting. It's something new, new and different every day. And as so, somebody who's who's studying and and written on highways, it uh yeah, you did the history of G dot yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> you, you, not you, not nearly as dry as a lot of people would think it is. Right, right. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of politics goes into roads. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So you work for the Daily Mississippian. Uh -huh. um, was that some? How did how did that work? Is it like does it very similar to the red and black? Where from a very early, you know, once you're in the journalism program, is that something that's yeah? That was one of expected? the first things I did was go down, um, go down to the DM and fill out an application. So, 
you know, started out as a staff writer, then uh, became um, editor of the opinion section and um, ran for editor, but uh, did not win, unfortunately. So is that your only political campaign? Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't an election. You know, some schools it is an election, mm-hmm. but, you know, you just basically they have a panel of people. And, sure. You know, they interview you and um, the. uh I think that the head of the department, I, I remember, told me that, you know, they thought that I was the most likely candidate to win them a Pulitzer, and I was also the most likely candidate to get them sued. So There's a fine <laughs> they line. Weren't, they weren't willing to take the risk. <laughs> <laughs> well, well what, what, were, what were those experiences like? What was it like covering news in Oxford, Mississippi in, in the 1990s? Um, well, the, the big thing that I remember is was the confederate flag issue which was on the ballot in i think 99 or 2000 um changing the state flag from um you know from the confederate flag to a different flag right um they did it a little differently in mississippi you know they didn't they didn't just do it they put it up for a vote uh which really turned into a circus Mm. um and how much of that spilled over into into oxford this wasn't just down in Jackson, I, I'm assuming, the, the sort of the circus. Uh, oh, no. I mean, we had, I mean, you know, people protesting on both sides. And, um, we had, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people coming down from Memphis. You know, there was there was a big Sons of Confederate Veterans chapter in Memphis. And Not far from Oxford, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how, did, how did, you know, covering, and maybe this is skipping ahead a little bit, how did how did working on a, on a college campus on on, on you know a you know, renowned college daily newspaper how did that prepare you for the news industry after you left college? Um, <clears throat> well, I, obviously, I was able to develop my reporting skills, but I I think I think the big thing was that it it really gave me a thick skin, um, and not so much not so much when I was a news reporter, but really being a columnist and being the opinion editor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a lot of opinions that were not very popular um, <laughs> on campus. Uh, you know, I was very much, uh, I was very much opposed to the Confederate flag, you know, when that was an issue. I wrote a lot about, uh, wrote a lot of things about racial issues that people didn't really appreciate, mm-hmm. um, white people didn't appreciate. But, um, and I, I, was, uh, I was really against the Iraq war from the very beginning. Um, and that was towards, Towards the very end of my college career, but I got a lot of flack for that too. It's it's a it's interesting, you know, because I was in high school and, and college when that was really going, and it was such a, a you know we, we think back to it, it was a very you know seminal point in our our right. lives and and you know college students today it's you know you're teaching history class it's it's history oh sure I mean now. they were like what two years old or something yeah when yeah eleven happened yeah. that's when I realized I was old was yeah. that my stu- <laughs> my my freshman students no longer. Knew, knew where they that. were when 9/11 happened. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah. okay. So I'm I'm old now, right? So so is that sort of an interest in in, in progressive um, issues, progressive politics? Is that what attracted you to Athens, um, or was that just no, the, the really. luck of the <laughs> luck of the draw? I I mean, as a you know, as a journalist, I mean, there's there's a difference between what I've written, I guess, as you know, as a as an opinion person in college and being a news reporter, I, mean, mm-hmm. I would describe myself as any kind of political leaning, really, in terms of like you know the political reporting that I've done. You right. know, I think I was always pretty pretty down the middle. So, um, but it, it it wasn't it really didn't have anything to do with politics. It was just a job, mm-hmm. you know. And I mean, and that it seemed, was with... it seemed like a cool city. There was a job opening, and I applied for it. And I got it. Moved to Athens. I mean, and and that was with the Banner Herald, right? Yeah. How, how would you describe the Banner Herald? You know, I think m- most people are familiar with with Cox Media, the AJC, mm-hmm. um, maybe some of the other major, you know, major dailies. Not, although they're not quite as major as they used to be. Nobody is. Nobody is, yeah. right? But how would you describe the Banner Herald and its ownership? <laughs> well, when when I when I got there, which I think was two thousand and five. Uh, it felt like it felt like a huge step up uh, for me. You know, I'd worked at a much smaller paper in Carsville, which is outside of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. That was my first job out of college, and I was there for maybe a year or two. And um, you know, it was just kind of one of those get your clips and move on kind of things. Um, but 
you know, that really introduced me to politics because I, I had a great beat. It was the environmental beat. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a good because, time for... Yeah, because they, they've got Lake Altoon up there and they've got uh, Plant Bowen. And um, so I was able to make a lot of contacts in Atlanta and in politics mm -hmm. um, that definitely helped me out down the road. But um, when, I, when I got to add, you know, it felt like a real newspaper to me. Um, you know, I kind of... I kind of felt like I finally made it, I guess, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, I can do this. This can be a career, you know. Um, but, you know, then the bottom fell out. I mean, the recession hit, and, you know, I mean, there were just cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts. And, cuts and you know, finally you're down to like, <laughs> I mean, you know, by the end, by the time I left, I mean, we were down to about the same size staff as like the tiny little paper that I'd come from, you know. So... It was unfortunate, but yeah, the the ownership it was owned by Morris out of Augusta, and uh, <laughs> they were not good owners. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, one of the few major newspapers to endorse President Donald Trump. Yeah. It, which I think was a shock to I think most them of the and, readership. Them in Las Vegas. Oh yeah, the uh, yeah. Which Sheldon, Sheldon Adels right. Adelson's. Yeah. Uh, Newspaper and the Morris papers, they were the only ones I think. Yeah, and of course, I was long gone by then. But, sure, sure. You know, it didn't surprise me. I mean, there would be directives out of Augusta from time to time, and you know, Billy Morris is extremely far to the right, you know, and he does not hesitate to, you know, use his uh, newspapers to spread his political beliefs. So, you know, there would be directives from time to time that, you know, we were to endorse certain people and things of, things of that nature, or they would send us. Must run columns, you know, almost like the, the, the must media run. Thing. Right, I was, I was just getting ready to say uh, in the past couple of weeks, um, you know, where they they made everybody talk about fake news on the air. Um, it was kind of like that, you know. They said you this like just way out there column about like illegal immigration or something like, and you had to run it. You know, I mean, they didn't give you any choice. So, well, you know, we, we you mentioned cuts and, and downsizing of newsrooms and. and the effects of that, I think, are pretty clear in terms of investigative reporting, local news especially. Yeah. But is, it, is there – what what will what's to become of something like an Athens Banner Herald or, or those local news that are outside of – or maybe in a medium-sized city like Athens but don't have the – yeah. The reach of an AJC or a, a Macon, even a Macon Telegraph or something right. like that. What What's to become of the, the, the news, the, the print media? <laughs> I wish I knew. Right? I don't know. We wouldn't be sitting here, I guess. Yeah. But. Um, you know, I'm not really, I'm not very optimistic. Um, you know, the Banner Herald was bought by, I guess about a year ago, six months ago maybe, it was bought by Gatehouse, um, which is basically a subsidiary of a hedge fund. Uh, and you have all these, you know, vulture capitalists, I guess would be, you know, a term a lot of people would use. A where, familiar story. <laughs> real, well, for a lot these, of newspapers getting... Sure, yeah. Like and I mean, Gatehouse owns like 500 papers, you know, and there are other companies like this. But, um, you know, they're not... They're just picking the bones. You know, they come in, they buy these distre distressed properties, you know, which a newspaper would be considered a distressed property these days. But, you know, it's almost like, you know, like... Uh, you know, if, if you've ever seen the movie Wall Street, you know, when, you know, Gordon Gecko buys the airline and then just guts it and he's going to sell it for parts. I mean, that's what they're going to do to these newspapers. They're going to suck every last drop of print advertising revenue that they can get out of it and then just shut them, shut them down and write them off on their taxes is what I think is going to happen. So does that get, you know, you went over to the flagpole 2011, 2010? 12, I think. 2012. Yeah. So d does that give breathing space for, for sort of the alternative weeklies or, or, or you know, I guess we can, online is a whole wholly separate yeah. discussion, but, but you know, I think I've read somewhere that where the similar purchasing up of, of alt weeklies it's happening, is happening yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, it happened in, in LA uh, where, um, you know, which is, which is a great all weekly or was, um, you know, you had a group of very conservative businessmen from Orange County who bought the LA Weekly and fired the whole staff. Uh, <laughs> you know, then you had, um, you know, I think the Baltimore Sun bought the uh, bought the Baltimore City paper and shut it down. You know, the Village Voice isn't printing anymore. They're online only. Hmm. Um, 
and that's a little bit of a different story uh, for alts, I think, because, and this doesn't really f affect flagpole, but, um, you know, the, the like stuff like back pages. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you if you remember, if you remember when you were younger, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd pick up a uh, you'd you'd pick up a creative loafing in Atlanta, and it'd be eighty pages thick, and you start flipping through it. You know, and you get to the back, and there's 20 pages of like escort ads. You know, I mean, you remember that? Uh, I don't remember creative loafing, but okay. but it was similar up in uh, up in St. Louis. Uh, right. I mean, I'm sure the riverfront times. A lot of them were the same. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then Craigslist, the loss of that um, really hurt all weeklies, and Flagpole's never accepted those kind of ads. So, um, you know, the raciest we get is, um, you know, the lingerie shop, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that really did hurt all weeklies. And, um, and of course, you know, all of the other factors involved with, you know, Facebook and Google. I mean, I think I read something that like 99% of digital, you know, new digital ad revenue, I think, goes to Facebook and Google, you know, that's right. not going to newspapers. Um, to companies that can do data metrics and... <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, you when you, and when you look at the loss of print and then you're not making that up on the digital side. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's much more difficult for a local paper because, you know, if you're, if you're in the New York Times or the Washington Post, which I think are thriving now, they're thriving online and they're making money, which is terrific, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have a national audience. Right. And when you look at the types of just sheer numbers that you need uh, to make any money online, you know, if you're, a, if you're a local publication, you just can't get to those numbers, you know? I mean, we have a, we have a readership of 120,000 because that's the size of Athens. And, you know, you need millions and millions of clicks to make money. And, you know, I mean, just the population is not there. We're ge too geographically limited. Right. Well, I, I guess to, you know, sort of a segue pivot point, but apart from being a, a daily newspaper like the Banner Herald and, and, and a weekly at the flagpole, what are the key differences when, when people are thinking, like, you went from one newspaper to another newspaper? What's, what's the difference in, in, in the sort of size, <clears throat> scope, purpose, mission, that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, Ban the Banner Herald, I think, in its heyday, you know, it was the paper of record, <laughs> um, you know, and, and all, everything that that entails. Um, and all weeklies, most of them started, well, Flagpole started in 87, but, you know, all weeklies started in the late 60s, and they were, you know, just like the name implies, alternatives. So, you know, uh, a much more lively voice, much more opinionated, uh, you know, much more... Um, political, usually to the left, um, you know, whereas, you know, your broadsheets are usually more conservative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Banner Herald definitely editorial, editorially has always been conservative, so. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and covering the, covering the music and the arts and, right. and you know, in a, in, a, in a much more engaged fashion than usually um, like a general interest newspaper would do. But as the dailies have shrunk, one of the challenges, for me at least, has been, well, if there's nothing in the daily, what are we an alternative to, you know? I mean, more and more, like, flagpole is the paper. It's, You're the establishment now. We're the establishment now, you know, and we're, we're a liberal paper in a liberal city, and we have a daily that, you know, doesn't really cover a whole lot, um, you know, and so... You know, for for a publication that's always been about kind of filling in the gaps, you know, the gaps just keep getting bigger, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden, like, you know, the Banner Herald is really the alternative paper at this point, I would say. The pro the numbers, um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Oh, our circulation is bigger than theirs. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we're one of the few alts in the country that can say that, that wow. our circulation is bigger than the than the than the the city's daily which is both good and i think we've been sitting here talking which is both good and has it has its upsides and downsides yeah i mean i take i take no pleasure in the demise of the banner herald you know i mean we need both we need everything we can get you know and if uh, i i think still if you you really have to read all three of the papers i think in this town you know including the red and black i think to really get a full picture of what's going on in the city well i, I guess that, that that gives us a good um you know pivot into where we're where we're going here in terms of you know covering politics in Georgia you you grew up here 
to a degree in, mm -hmm. in Atlanta. How would you describe Georgia politics? And we can talk about Athens in a little bit. How would you describe Georgia politics to a, to an outsider? You know, somebody who moved down here, you know, say somebody who, who, who left college in Missouri, moved down to Georgia, yeah. never, never lived in Georgia before. How would you describe Georgia's politics and how it's changed since you've really been covering um, uh, state and local politics since the early 2000s? I think to put it in a nutshell, it's an, it's an intramural sport. Um, you know, the Democrats are totally irrelevant and everything comes down to, you know, the, the moderate business wing of the Republican Party is really the Democrats and, you know, the hardcore religious right libertarian wing of the party, you know, they're the Republicans. And that's probably the best way to think about it. <laughs> and that's changed a lot since I've been here because, you know, I was here for the flip. Yeah. Um, when we did have, you know, one party rule for the Democrats and then, you know, when I moved back here after college, it was the exact time that, you know, for about four years we actually had a real two party system and then it just flipped back the other way. So so, so b between two thousand two and two thousand eight there was you know there there was something and I I yeah. guess you know. Six, I would say, but yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, Jim Martin, he put up a, a Wow we, we, right. We, we that was an interesting race. We should talk about that one. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I mean, what what? You know, being in the Athens area, you know, you're seventy miles from Atlanta. Yeah. What was your role in covering state politics? And, um, and what what were those races that that really stand out? Well, I we had we had an Atlanta bureau, and there were four people, and then there were three, and then there was one. Uh, and now there's none. They I saw that down. movie on PBS last night. Yeah. It didn't end well. <laughs> they shut it down eventually. So, um, you know, my my role was basically, you know, during the session I would go up there maybe, you know, four or five times during okay. the session. If there was something of particular interest to Athens or, you know, they needed help up there, you know, at the bureau, you know, I would just you know, go and it was miserable because I had to get up at four o'clock in the and morning. Then it was and, op you know, opening, <laughs> crossover, signy die. Stuff like that, yeah, right. See who who see who see resigned to run for office yeah. the day, you know, <laughs> midnight Qualified, after, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, you know, and a lot of that you can just do online now, but I mean, you know, 10 years ago you couldn't, that stuff was not Sure. Bad, so, um, you know, and I covered our local delegation. I covered, um, I covered the statewide races, uh, you know, to a degree. Um, you know, when the candidates would come to Athens, you know, obviously I would cover them. And um, I, I was pretty, <laughs> I was pretty good at, you know, scooping the big boys, I think. Um, you know, even though it wasn't my full-time job, you know, I was, I'd be pretty proud of myself if I could get one over on them, you know, <laughs> uh, Shine and all those guys at the AJC. Um, <laughs> get one over on Jim Galloway. Yeah, exactly. So that was always fun. <laughs> but those, those guys are so nice, though, and every time oh, I yeah. show up, in Atlanta, you know, I mean, you know, 22 year old kid, you know, and go in the press box and you're just kind of like, oh, what do I do? You know, and they were all so nice to me. You know, Crawford and Dick Pettis. I was like, Dick was Pettis alive. would have been there, yeah, you know, right at that I time. Mean, yeah. So what what about Athens politics? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're the proverbial, um, we being Athens, here, the, the, the blue, blue island in the, in the sea of red. Right. Does that does that hold when we talk about actual city county governance and elections, or or what's your take on it? I've always I've always thought it's really tough to put local issues in partisan boxes. Okay. Um, you know, we t when we talk about liberal or really progressive would be the preferred term um, for most people. Um, mm -hmm. Progressive or conservative in Athens, you know, we're really talking about development. You know, we're not talking about gun control, abortion. You know, all these we're things that we green space, and, right? Yeah. yeah, we're talking Firefly about firefly trails. You know, let let anybody come in and build anything they want. Versus, you know, we really need to control our growth. Basically, mm -hmm. that's what the debate usually is about. And it's of course environmental issues are involved, and transportation issues are involved. But you know, it's it's not the same issues as on the state national level. You know, the thinking back on on, on you know, Athens, you know, we've we've had in terms of governors, you know, or mayors, excuse me, Gwen O'Looney, mm -hmm. uh, Heidi Davidson, and then Nancy Denson. 
Dog. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Doc. <laughs> that happens, I suppose. My apologies uh, to, to 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 our, our our Republican mayor, Doc. He wasn't a Republican at the time. Well, I mean, I'm sure he was, but Doc's the kind of guy he could go either way. I, oh, sure. I don't think I think if you talk to Doc now, he'd be like, I don't even know what I am. But well, I, I, know, I think he definitely wasn't happy when the Republicans kind of went off the rails a few years ago, but. Well, I, I guess that, that gets us to, to the question of, of sort of how things have changed or if things are changing in mm-hmm. the state. You know, to get your assessment on you know, why, why were Georgia Democrats able to hold on to power for so long, either in states like Alabama mm-hmm. or longer here in Georgia? The, the, probably the biggest factor was just inertia. I mean, incumbency, you know, and I mean, the Democrats were able, just like the Republicans are doing now, to use redistricting to, you know, kind of cling to power um, for a few more years, and that sort of blew up in their face, but I mean, I really think it was just, you know, there, 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 was, there, was, a, there, was, a, there was a breed of conservative Democrat that I think uh, really no longer exists, um, you know, and they kind of died out. You skipped right next to my next question. <laughs> you know, once the once Georgia those, Democrats, once those people started retiring, you know, and I'm talking about, or you know, they just got behind the times, really, and you know, I mean, I'm talking about people like Tom Murphy, you know, sure, who, sure, sure, who was around for 40 years, and then finally, you know, it just got to the point where, you know, the trend, you know, started at the federal level, and. Mm-hmm. You know, I think 92 was the last time a Democrat won Georgia, uh, Bill Clinton. Correct. Um, you know, so then it took about 10 years, but it trickled down to the state level, and all of a sudden you got some random guy popping up running against Tom Murphy, you know, the... Bill Heath. Bill Heath, that's right. Yeah. Bill Heath. And, um... State senator now, Tom Murphy. so he, he, he is. He is stuck now. around. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I guess that, that begs the question. It's like how, and maybe you've already touched on this a little bit, how different in terms of governance and priorities have a Governor Sonny Perdue and a governor, especially Governor Nathan Deal, yeah. how different has that been from a Joe Frank Harris? And, and you know, the populist rhetoric aside and the Hope uh, Scholarship aside of, of, of Zell Miller, how different have, have, been, have the Republican governors been from those Democrats? Joe Frank Harris is probably a little before my time. No, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, no, you know, no. I was no. just a little kid when he was governor, but I don't know much about him to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, well, he was from Cartersville, and I heard a lot of stories when I when I was in Cartersville about Joe Frank Harris, and a lot of them had to do with uh, having roads built in ways that would, you know, benefit um, people he knew, um, which I think is something he had in common with Governor Purdue. So that's one comparison you could make. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I, I actually think Deal has been, he's been pretty progressive, especially for a Republican. I'm know? sure he, I, he loves all, all these, these journalists on this program referring to him as the, oh, the most sure. progressive governor in the deep but, south. But I mean, look at, look at what he's done. He's, you know, criminal justice reform. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, if a Democrat tried to do that, it would never, it oh, would sure. never happen. You know, sure. that was like a real, like... Nixon goes to China, kind of thing. Yeah, I think Brian Robinson made that point very early, early okay. on in this program. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, he did some things that you know Democrats would probably love to do, but I don't think they could have done. Or, or, or I mean, or blocking, you know, religious blocking, freedom. Yeah, blocking a lot of bathroom really conservative bills, legislation that probably would have been bad for the state. And I think Speaker Ralston's been really good about that too, kind of keeping the keeping the crazy bottled up in the legislature for the most part. Well, and and, and that's you know what you were mentioning mentioning about when the when the Democrats governed, they governed from the center right, center left, depending on a little bit. On yeah, I would say issues. In Georgia, you center left with education, maybe, yeah, but sure. center right normally. Right. Um, and you would, you know, with with Speaker Ralston, Governor Deal, that's been yeah. A continuation more than a yeah. discontinuity, and I don't really, I don't really see, I don't really see a whole lot of difference between a moderate Republican and a, and a conservative Democrat. Um, you know, in terms of the way the state's governed, I, I don't think it's really changed all that much. Um, and and a lot of it has to do with these are the same people, you know. I mean, 
Nathan Deal was a Democrat until you know, Perdue. whenever he switched, 92, 94? Na 95. 95, got, yeah. okay, yeah. He survived the 94. You know, the, the Gingrich <laughs> Revolution, and then everybody switched. April and, 95. Yeah, and Sonny was a Democrat, so I mean, we're, we're same people. I don't know that their beliefs really changed, you know, it's just the letter by their name. Right, right. Um, you know, and they saw which way the wind was blowing and took advantage of it. Well, and... And there, there was another little wavelet of that too in 2010. Right. Remember when the when the Republicans really they swept everything. You know, right. the last few statewide offices. I think when you know when Mike ran for Senate and uh, Thurber, Thurber ran Baker, for governor. You know, and, and there was one more. Oh, it was Tommy uh, Tommy, uh, Irvin Tommy Irvin re retired. retired. Yep. And so you know, those were the three offices that were held by Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, got those and then mm -hmm. they ran everything right um, and then you saw you know another trickle of people I think six or seven legislators switch parties after that one one from, from one five from Athens, points Doug down, yeah and that was a shocker because Doug was pretty liberal and now he's way far the other side so um, but then you had people like Alan Powell which oh you know, yeah Alan Powell didn't change, you know. <laughs> or, or like go, going back to 2000. He just wanted to get reelected, and he thought that's what he had to do. Yeah, so. yeah. The Jack Hill down in down in you know South Georgia. Yeah, I think somebody said he could run as a communist, but and win, <laughs> but his politics would probably be the same. Yeah. So, that's so those about right. those Georgia Democrats, what it what it took to get elected were. were Strong, overwhelming support with African Americans and minorities, yeah. and rural white conservative voters. The, uh -huh. the 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 night and day coalition. Yeah. What broke that, and can it be fixed for for Democrats? I guess probably the number one thing would have been the flag. Yeah, I think when I when I moved here, I guess it was what was it two thousand? It was it was after two. It must have been two thousand three because mm -hmm. it was after right after Sonny got elected. But, yeah, you know, and I was in North Georgia, um, you know, fairly rural, exurban maybe area, and I mean, people were furious. I mean, they were furious about that. So, you got them worked up I, in Bartow. I County. don't know a lot about South Georgia, but I would imagine. I think South Georgia was a little bit later than North Georgia in switching and flipping. Right. Yes. Um, but I would have to imagine that would have something to do with it. But, you know, more and more and more, I see state and now even local level politics really becoming nationalized. Yeah. Um, and I think that had a lot to do with it, too, because people have been voting Republican, uh, you know, for president for a while and then also for Congress and for Senate, you know, and then finally they started voting just straight ticket Republican all the way down the line. You, I guess this sort of blends with the next question about the fault lines within the Georgia Democratic Party. You know, as you know, they they're spending their years in the political wilderness um, and have been since the <clears throat> early mid two thousands. What are the the major fault lines within the Democratic Party? Are they mainly uh, Georgia Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. Are they mainly along racial lines, or is there actual, honest to goodness, ideological? Uh, divisions within the state party I think it's more about tactics hmm. I don't I don't think it's really that much about policy um, I, I think the the big argument that's going on in the Democratic Party right now at the state and the national level is how do you win an election you know do you do you try to reach for the people in the middle or do you try to turn out your base right you know and one of them involves maybe moving a little to the right, and one involves moving a little to the left. But you know, that's more. I think that's more about um, really packaging and marketing and appearances, really, than a actual substantive policy. You know? Right. So I mean, I think I think the party has moved a lot to the left. I think policy wise, and I think the disagreement right now is really about like how do we like package ourselves. Well, I, let's get, get your perspective on that. You know, we've talked about the, the Democrats being out of power effectively it, since 2010, mm -hmm. no statewide yeah. offices. Um, why have the Democrats been unable to to find a way back, um, maybe not, not to power, but to really competitive, uh, a, a re you know, a competitive party since then?
Well, I mean, it just takes a long time. I, you know, I mean, look at how long it took the Republicans to That's achieve the, this. You know, I mean, it took them 30 years of building an infrastructure and, you know, until finally the moment came. And, and we can count you know, 100 nothing, years nothing before changes, that, <laughs> Nothing changes until it does, you know. And so you and kind of go along and then switch quickly. it was, bam, you know, it happened in a hurry. But all that had been building up for a very long time. And so I think it'll be the same for the Democrats. Um you know, that that and I don't think I think when they first when this flip first happened, um, I think they were just stunned. And I think a lot of them really didn't understand how deep trouble they were in or didn't want to. Mm-hmm. You know, they were a little bit in denial maybe. It was like, Oh, we'll just come back and win next year, two years from now. You know, well, I mean, when you see a seismic change like that, it doesn't really work that way you know right I mean, they didn't recognize it as being like a semi-permanent <laughs> flip which i think a lot of observers did you know like okay this is the way it's going to be now for a while i think i think a lot of them were just kind of like oh well, we'll we'll get the next one you know but the whole landscape had changed sure so sure and and we're, and we're now several <clears throat> next ones right down the road from and that. it's always oh and the demographics and you know blah 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 and like somehow I mean, eventually the Republican Party is going to run out of white people. But I mean, the way the way that it works right now, it seems like, you know, for every for every person of color who registers to vote, another white person becomes a Republican. So you have the stasis. Um, you know, that hasn't really helped very much. Well, I, when what is that road back to power? Is it is it in in your in your assessment? See, waiting until the demographics finally flip or is there a policy prescription or d- d- does something have to happen to the Republican Party for the Democrats to take advantage to, to you know, what's that look like? I kind of lean towards the more of the base turnout strategy, I think. The, the recent special elections. Yeah, we just had. I think that works better. Um, yeah, and I mean that—that's part of the reason why I think that is because you had a lot of candidates who ran, you know, really unabashedly progressive campaigns and were able to, you know, what they what they flip five seats, five um, seven, something like that. Two here in Athens. Yeah, and there so were the one seventeenth, the one nineteenth, the Georgia sixth. Yeah. So I know three. And I think a Senate seat too. Um, Jen, Jen, Jen Jordan, um, <laughs> Jordan, where, where, where I'm from in the Midwest, um, one Hunter Hill seat. Uh, um, there, there might've been some DeKalb County or Henry yeah. County seats. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but anyway, they did really well. We'll just put it that way. Right. Yeah. Um, and of course those are special elections. So, I mean, you can't read too much into it, but you know, that seemed to work. But, um, you know, at the same time, I am a little bit skeptical of, the idea of, you know, like Stacey Abrams talks about, like we're going to register like however 200,000 voters or whatever, you know, I, maybe, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think she said she was going to register a million last time and she got about 80,000 or something like that. So, you know, I mean, and how many of those people actually, you know, I mean, there's, you can probably tell me there's, there's literature on this, but what sure. is it, 10%, 20%, something like that. It's a low number. Of, of of people, you know, when you go out and register people, how many, what percentage of them actually vote? You know, I think a it's relative, low. depending on your demographic and and your your community, yeah. it, it has a lot of effect on that. Um, the places where Stacey Abrams is talking about um, registering, you know, the the, the untapped African American base vote, mm-hmm. I think, is what she's she's referring to. Yeah, um, turnout numbers are. Are less are lower than 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 white voters. Okay. The bigger the bigger drop is with um, Hispanic voters uh-huh. do not vote at, at the levels of of, of Caucasian right. and African American. And I think even citizens that mm-hmm. applies to. So. But but if you look here in Athens, the lowest turnout areas in Athens are, um, apart from the the student. Areas where they they vote at so home, definitely the minority neighborhoods would would be Marlo east or, east yeah. Athens, right. so and, sort of near north, east, the north side and, of town, which right. is pretty Hispanic. Yeah. So I think what is that? Uh, those would be precincts two A, two B, 
and would be the low turnout up around um, up around Newton Bridge area, right. you know, Vincent Drive. Probably. Right. I don't know what precinct that is, but well, that might be a vibe too. But anyway, yeah, we're, right. We're sort of in the weeds we're, here. We're getting but, way but, off but, on a yeah. tangent. But I mean, the point is there. There's a you got to register a whole lot of people, you know, to make up. Right. You know that two hundred thousand vote gap that you have to make up. Right. You know, can you actually do that? You know, can you and can you register them and then can you get them to turn out? Can you drive them to the polls? You know, and maybe this year because there's just so much like people are really chomping in the bit to go vote. Right. You know, I mean, especially on the left. I mean, they really want to get out there and vote. Um, so maybe the enthusiasm is there. I don't know. Could be, you know, I mean, but even, you know, at the same time, I mean, even Obama's coattails weren't enough. Right. You know, right. I mean, the yeah, we're cr- talking incredibly 2008, gifted yeah. African-American politician who took African-American turnout to new heights, um, you know, still lost by five points in Georgia. Mm-hmm. So. so so look at it from the other perspective. You know, the Republicans have been in charge now for 15 years. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest threat to their governing minority? The biggest threat to the Republicans? Yeah. Um, Being too far to the right. You know, really really giving into their base, I think. Um, Keeping them in check. Uh, And they've told me this, you know. I remember having a conversation with, um, with Ralston one time where, you know, he told me that, you know, that's really the biggest danger, um, that faces them is you know if they if they get too far to the right then that leaves the middle open um actually you know i i don't remember if that was ralston or not i think it might have been brian kemp who said hmm. that. which would be which, which i guess brian was a lot different ba- begs <laughs> a, brian was a lot different question. you know eight, eight or ten years ago um anyway but i remember i mean republicans have said this to me too you know i mean this is not just my opinion sure but, sure um you know they know they know that they can't they can't get too far to the right you know and there's that but there's that 20 to 30 percent you know that votes in primaries you know who are extremely conservative and they're they have a lot of a, re- a really inordinate amount of power i think in this state because of the primary system that we have right where the most conservative 10 or 15 percent of people you know are deciding a primary and then, you know, the district usually is, I mean, the Republicans guaranteed to win. So, you know, there's really a fringe that um, is responsible for electing most of the people in the legislature. So is, is that the, is that the tension within the Republican party, the sort of business establishment? Let's, you know, pull out all the stops for Amazon, HQ2, Starbucks mm-hmm. is building a new headquarters. Let's do that too, kind of thing. Right. And then the sort of ideological I it's all it's perhaps unfair to say but I the Josh McCoon wing of, of the Georgia Republican Party the, the Columbus state senator right um, is, is that the tension with between you know I think Josh McCoon's kind of a kind of a faction onto himself but <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he tends to be on an island about a lot of things but I, I understand what you're saying the, uh, the Josh yeah. McCoon annex sure <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there we've obviously seen tension um, mm-hmm. along those lines, um, and it's it, it's interesting to me that the most progressive force in state politics today is corporations, which I think is very interesting. Um, that's not something that I would have expected, um, you know, when I was <laughs> right. When I, you know, when I was in college, and we were all like, you know, everybody was like protesting the WTO and reading out oh. busters, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, now, you know, now we're like, yay, corporations! Like, you know, you're the only people who can stop discrimination in Georgia. Somewhere, Tom Frank, like, Thomas Frank's like throwing down his yeah. gla- his, his glasses <laughs> in anger about the bafflers, right? Uh, baffled. <laughs> Well, I guess that, that, that begs the question of, of the role of economic development in changing politics. Um, it's an election year. There was a big dust, you know, a big flap over the NRA and Delta. <clears throat> um, how much is that going to matter? Or is this sort of, is this going to be more and more commonplace in politics of, 
well, Delta's weighed in and, and Marvel Studios has weighed in, uh, Coke and Delta and, and, yeah. and you know, those kind of, th those major Fortune 500 entities. Um, if Georgia's embracing this number one place to do business, right. has that uh, has that invited this sort of participation or is this something more organic? I think it has to do with these companies understanding, you know, what what side their bread is butter on. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of policies that, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about something that might, you know, discriminate against the LGBT community or discriminate against immigrants, um, discriminate against African Americans. I mean, you know, when, when you look at the, de especially when you look at the demographic of people that these companies are trying to sell products to, you know, they're predominantly young people. Right. And these ideas that, you know, this, that the, the, the right wing of the Republican Party are pushing are extremely unpopular uh, amongst the demographic that buys these companies' products for the most part. Um, so I think that is really what's driving it. I mean, I think it's just money, pretty much. Demographics, you know, we've talked about demographics. One, one of the ways to, to control, and, and control in a very you know, negative authoritarian sense, redistricting and reapportionment. What effect did that 2011, or I guess we're talking, we could actually talk mid-decade, the 2005 mm -hmm. reapportionment, what, what effect did those have on the politics in <clears throat> Athens? Uh, both 2005 and 2011. Well, the two, I guess you're, 2005, you're, I guess you're talking about Kaiser? You're um, talking about the Senate seat? That, yeah, it must have been 2005. Okay. Yeah, because um, yeah, Brian yeah, Kemp and there, Jane well, Kidd were... Yeah, there were, well, there were a couple things that happened. Um, one was they took Athens out of John Barrow's congressional district. So that had a, a the big effect away. on politics they were trying to get rid of Barrow and of course it didn't work it took him you know took him 10 years to get rid of the guy but they, f <laughs> they chased him to Savannah and then they chased him to Augusta and they finally got him but um, I mean that had a big effect on Athens because you know suddenly you know this liberal town is represented by a Republican um, first Charlie Norwood and then Paul Brown after Norwood died um, and then you know they split uh, Athens in half um, to elect Bill Kauser to the Senate, um, you know, that gave, instead of one Democratic state senator, we wound up with two Republican state senators. So that had a big effect, you know, because, you know, they're not really representative of the city. So, um, and then the 11-1, the um, that affected local politics too, because that was when they... Yeah, that was... When McKillop... Um, you know, basically unilaterally drew new commission districts. That's, we used to have the two super right. super districts. Yeah. That's right. And God, he, he was that. trying to, he started mucking around. And of course, the legislature does this. The commission has no control over their right. own maps. You know, nobody, hardly anybody wanted, uh, you know, this map that McKillop drew. But of course, that's the one that passed. Mm -hmm. um, so we lost our super districts and... Uh, lost a also lost a minority representative on the commission. So, in a city that we have that's 27, 28 percent African American, now we have one out of ten was that, commissioners. Was that was that Melissa Link's district? Yeah, now? that was when George Maxwell retired. Maxwell, right. that's right. And they they put um, they put Boulevard into George Maxwell's district, and so you know, I mean the. Boulevard voters overwhelmed. Um, the, although, you know, I will say that, you know, M Melissa really won that seat by reaching out to the African American community. So I don't want to imply. Well, it, that, it was a very. I, I don't want to imply that she, you know, was that only white people supported Melissa because that wasn't the case whatsoever. But no, her race was against Rachel Watkins. Yeah, that was uh, the runoff. That was there a, was an African American guy in the race, but he didn't even make the runoff. So. Well, I think that, that was also the redistricting that, um, oh, was it her? Representative Heard, who they brought, they brought more voters in from from yeah. They tweaked his Boulevard, a bit. Cobham, Normal yeah, Town, and that may have you know, that may have for tipped Fry. it over to Spencer Fry. That's right. true. Yeah, that's very true because he had had a 
uh, a white challenger um, the prior election cycle and had won won the primary right. by you know, not not a not a small margin but not a big one. I don't remember exactly, but it was somewhere in the realm of you know fifty five forty five maybe. So you know, I mean, yeah, a couple thousand voters one way that could easily tip that. Yeah. <clears throat> so looking ahead, you know, put out put on your your your. your your cap and the crystal ball. What, what does the the Republican legislature have in store for for the Athens area in terms of redistricting in twenty twenty one? I was actually a little bit surprised that they didn't just go ahead and do it this year. You know, they obviously they have no qualms about doing. Which I used think to they be, did. They did want. Which used to be for Bowdoin County for that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you did not. You know, you didn't do mid decade redistricting, but they have no qualms about doing that. And I'm really surprised that they didn't. Go ahead and um, for, tweak for Gonzalez and one seventeen and one nineteen. You know that they didn't just go ahead and do that now. Um, I guess they think they can come back and in a more typical general election November environment. You know they must think that they can win those seats back uh, without messing with mm -hmm. the lines. But um, you know if they don't, uh, I think we'll definitely see. You know, and now that and now that the. Uh, a big chunk of the Voting Rights Act has been struck down. Right, the pre-clearance um, and every um, yeah, that, yeah that affects five. that affects Spencer's district because he's not protected anymore. Mm -hmm. Because even though that's a, <clears throat> it's not majority minority, but it's pretty close. You know, it's, yeah, I'm it's, not it's, sure what the numbers. It's like fifty five forty five or sixty forty or something. But anyway, it's enough. It's enough that under the Voting Rights Act, the way that it used to be, right. you know, if if you were if you were in the thirties or above, you were protected. You know, you couldn't split that up, but now they can. So I mean, it you know, they Dip might down they in might Madison, Jackson they might find County. a way. You never know. I mean, they might find a way to like uh, get rid of Spencer and you know split that between two or three Republican districts that could absorb all those Democrats. Um, you know, and we could just have. Eight different house districts in Athens, and they're all Republicans. You know, I mean, they could do that. Well, I mean, I mean, I guess it would be a, a Republican version of what what Governor Barnes did. You know, and the the, the Barnes Bobby Kahn redistricting brought back the multi member districts. And yeah, well, they can't do that. That got ruled unconstitutional. <laughs> right. Yeah, so you, you want you want to see folks get 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 upset oh, or get heated? Yeah. No, I remember Interview that. That was one of the first things I covered when I moved here. Yeah, that lawsuit. That was. Whew. Oh yeah, and when that got struck down, man, the, the, all those guys got swept out. Mm -hmm. You know, I covered all those, you know, Paul Smith and Buddy Childers and Buddy you know, Childers. There's Nathan a name, Dean, I All those, all those old guys who've been around for thirty or forty years, man. I mean, after that happened, they were gone. They were goners, and it was the uh, the gay marriage amendment. You know, oh yeah, that tied Democrats up in knots, and that really drove turnout. I was up in Missouri for when Republicans. That was... I mean, that was, was a stroke on. of genius politically, putting that thing on the ballot. The Carl uh, Carl Rose masterstroke. Yeah, uh, in '04. <laughs> well, I mean, since we 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 moved on to presidential politics, <laughs> what effect? For first of all, Donald Trump. How would you define Donald Trump's politics? What is Trumpism? Is, is it a thing? <laughs> and how does it fit within the Republican Party? I think Trumpism, Trumpism is triggering the libs. That is my. That is what I like to say about Trumpism. <laughs> that is all that matters. It's just pissing off liberals. Anything, anything that pisses off liberals is good. <laughs> I mean, that's really the whole. There's no coherent ideology. You know, there's nothing like that. It's just whatever is going to make liberals mad. That's Trumpism. Is is, is that accepting the premise? Is that a durable? I mean, that's my theory. Sure, though. sure, sure, sure. Um, is that a? What sort of effect is that going to have down to to the Georgia political level? Are we seeing it? Have we seen it? People are trying it. Um, it's not really working very well. I don't think. I, I, I you're probably referring to like Senator Mike Williams. Yeah. Um, yeah. Him, him, and Brian Kemp. You know, who mentions Trump every chance he can get, and you know, talks a lot about talks a lot about stuff Trump talks about, talks about immigrants, talks about gangs. You know, like they're you know these 
<laughs> you know, like our cities are like this dystopia, you know, like, like you know, Trump talked about it. American carnage. The American carnage speech, exactly, yeah. Um, and the inner cities and all that, which... You know, have you been to the fourth ward lately? I mean, have you like, you know, there's like, a, it's, it's not carnage. It's like an organic, you know, vegan grocery store and yeah. blue bottle coffee. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think we saw a, a similar approach. I mean, we'll set aside the Alabama special election for Senate because Roy Moore is such a wild card. Um, but in Virginia with Ed Gillespie, mm-hmm. the MS-13 immigration. Yeah, he went. And it's not a, it's not a fit for everybody, you know, because Ed Gillespie is a, he's an establishment as you get. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the thing that puzzles me about Brian too, is like, this is not the Brian Kent that I knew, you know, I mean, I covered Brian when he was in the Senate. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he was just as milquetoast as could be, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure Brian Kent never had an opinion it. on anything when he was in the Senate, you know, <laughs> but it was, you know, he was in the swing district. So, I mean, that was smart, you know, he's trying to sure, play, it, play sure. it down the middle. Um, you know, I mean, he never, when he ran for secretary of state, he never really struck me as being particularly, you know, I don't think, I can't think of I mean, anything conservative, but not camping. like, you know, there was, I mean, it wasn't like he, he, he's trying to run on this, um, you know, this Trump kind of platform and it just doesn't, it doesn't suit him to me. It just like, I'm just like, what do you, what? You well, I, I mean, I guess that, that, that does Trumpism survive? however long Donald J. Trump is in the White House? Or is I th- this a... I, th- I think it's a one-off. You know, Trump is Trump. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think you can duplicate that. Right. Um, well, and, and, I, and I mean, you can look at the polls now. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, Casey Cagle's running away with it. And, you know, I think, you know, but Brian's maybe, Brian's second or third and Williams is fourth-ish. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're pretty I mean, far behind. Right, and I, I, we can talk about that in a little bit about you know whether this is a replay of 2010 with John Oxendine or if this is an honest to goodness front yeah. runner who's going to stay there. I think he's. I think it's for real, um, and we're not too far away now. Yeah, you know? oh I mean, I think if God. Casey was going to crater, I think we would have done it by now. But I mean, you're right, Oxendine did. Mm-hmm. But I, but, but I that think was because you're right. John, John Oxendine, you know, spent you know 16 years of his life just sticking his face in front of every TV camera he could find. You know, I don't think Casey's necessarily done that. So, you know, it was just pure name recognition for Oxidine, I sure. think. And once people started to do, think about the race and think about who they were going to vote for, they were like, oh, I don't know about him. You know, he had all kinds of ethical problems and, you know, people found out about. So, mm-hmm. um, But I feel like that happened a lot earlier in the race than, than the point that we're at now. So I think if that were going to happen to yeah, Casey, we're, it would have already happened. We're what? A month and five weeks out. Five weeks out. Oh, yeah, I can't believe it's actually that. the The airwaves haven't been as inundated with ads as I thought they would would have been. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, I don't know what people are waiting for, but well, there's so many people running. I don't think the money is there the way that it's been in the past. Well, I mean, I guess the next thing I had to talk about was because it's what, so spread out. You what, know? The John Ossoff Karen Handel race, you know, uh, the the most expensive United yeah, States what was house, it, fifty million dollars. It was. Oh, I'm not sure about the to- total. I know how much Ossoff spent, which was thirty one to thirty five million. Um, they had so much money they didn't even know what to do with it all. Right. I mean, the, the issue of <laughs> diminishing returns. Yeah. You know, you I think it actually run. backfired on him. I think he was on the air so much that. People got really, really irritated with seeing his ads. I think it may actually have hurt him. Well, I mean, I unpack that race. You, know, you had John. No, I didn't cover that race. Well, I, mean, I know. I know. I know. But I mean, but, I followed it, but I didn't. I didn't cover it. So, sure. Yeah. You you are an interested uh, surveyor of the political <laughs> land. Uh, is, is that a demographic issue, or was that the Power, did that actually show how powerful the, the quote-unquote resistance to Donald Trump is in, in those sort of neighborhoods in the Georgia 6th? I think it just shows you how Republican the district is. Um, I mean, I think they literally ran out of Democrats. Yeah, 52 to 48. Yeah, was, and I was, mean, but I think they got I think they got really, really almost every single Democrat in that district to turn out and vote, but it just wasn't enough people. Right. You know, because it is a, you know, whatever, 
R plus six or seven district. R plus six, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you're talking 5644. So, you know, you spend $31 million to get four extra percentage points. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's a, a real good investment. Um, you know, especially in, uh, it was a special election, so I mean, people didn't, people were just so angry, they just wanted to spend their money on something, and that was the only game in town, you know, I mean, at that point, but. Well, and and of course, Karen Handel's up for yeah. re-election. And I think that, I think that San Francisco ad was brilliant, too, I think that, <laughs> I think that really was effective. Yeah, it was, uh, I don't, I don't know who, who, who did the ad, but I'm sure they've made lots of, yeah. Good contacts and good jobs off well, of that. And you're one. seeing that being duplicated. Yeah, all over the country. It's uh, you know with, with um, Rob Woodall's seat in Gwinnett, yeah. which is probably a much more likely pickup. If, That's a flippable it, seat, you right? Know? I mean, I would tend to think it probably won't happen until he leaves. I think when it's an open seat, it'll flip. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to beat an incumbent, you know, and you're. Especially in Gwinnett County, I mean, you're really relying heavily on the Hispanic community to turn out, and as we discussed earlier, that's probably not really a safe bet. So, well, I think there are actually there there may be a Hispanic candidate running. I'm not sure, but I know there's a, a Vietnamese entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, I, the name escapes me at the moment, which which I think we're seeing more of mm -hmm. in in, in the well, there's state also legislative. sizable Asian community. Oh right, in yeah, County, Duluth, sure. the, you know, the Buford and Buford and Highway. Right. Buford Highway, yeah, not the city of, sorry. Right. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, we you know, you turn on television or read read the the, the political stories, everything's blue wave this, blue wave mm -hmm. coming, you know, meaning, you know, a seismic shift in, in terms of Congress, Senate, governors' mansions in the favor of Democrats. Do you think it, it reaches Georgia? And if so, where? <laughs> I'm not sure. Something feels different to me about this year. You know, the 538 of, people would be wretching know, to but, hear that yeah, you have a right, gut but, feeling about. about well, yeah, you know what? But I mean, my <laughs> gut, my gut told me Donald Trump was had a, actually had a pretty good chance to win, and I didn't listen to it. So <laughs> I, I, I vowed that I would listen more to my gut and less to my brain. Right after that. <laughs> Because everything, everything I thought I knew about politics, like flew out the window. I know nothing. Um, <laughs> Could throw the binder yeah. away. Um, but yeah, ordinarily, I mean, I would say no, probably not, because it never has. You know, I mean, we had a wave in, we had a wave in '06, and we had a wave mm -hmm. in '08, and you know, it didn't make any difference to Georgia, right? So, but maybe it will this time. I don't know. You know, um, we'll see. I guess. You know, a lot of it depends on, I think, the top of the ticket, um, right. you know, on both, for both parties. What is, what's the matchup going to be? Right. It, well, let's, you know, you've got on the Democratic side, and we've already talked about the different, we, we didn't sort of put the names to the strategies or the yeah. tactics, but Stacey Abrams, which is the you know, turn, turn out, out the base, base yeah. and, and Stacey Evans, which is sort of the the older school Roy Barnes sort of centrist, you know, open hand to both. Well, that's the image she's trying to project. I sure. Mean, I, I think they're both fairly progressive. You know, they may have, you know, they have some differences on a few issues, you know, where I think you could say one is more progressive, you know, probably Evans is more progressive on education. Abrams might be more progressive on, you know, something like, things like guns. Right. Um, but I think on the whole, they're both fairly even you know, in terms of where they fall on the spectrum. But that's the image that, you know, this is what we were talking about, you know, how do you how do you market yourself, you know, that's kind of what I was talking about, mm -hmm. is, you know, it's really more about the image that you project, really, than any particular policy difference, because I don't think anyone is going into the voting booth being like, knowing the nuances of, like, <laughs> candidates, you know, 10-point plan on, you know, like, pre-K or whatever. If but... 2016 showed us anything, <laughs> it was that 10-point that plans. Yeah, didn't... I mean, people really, I think, they, they vote based on, you know, kind of emotion and, um, you know, really sort of tribalism um, and not necessarily um, really wonky policy stuff. Right, 
so if you're handicapping the Democratic race with, 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 with Evans and Abrams, yeah, I, I think the conventional wisdom is, well, African Americans make up the, the majority of, of the Democratic primary voters and voters do. generally. Yeah, they but, usually do. But in 2010, Thurbert Baker was, was the, yeah. you know, an African American, very well known, had one statewide office. But Barnes had such strong ties to the, to the black community in Atlanta. It, the, the Vincent Fort connection yeah. that, that he had there, which he also has. With which is kind of like, Stacey I Evans. mean, it was kind of like Clinton, Clinton and Obama. You know, yeah. I mean, it was sort of the same thing. I mean, the, the a lot of African Americans were really slow to embrace Obama. John Lewis just, endorsed Hillary Clinton. You know, endorsed Hillary not Clinton Barack because Obama. he's known Hillary Clinton for thirty years. Right. And they're friends, you know, and 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 black people knew Hillary Clinton and thought that she was acceptable. And you know, I I think and I think a lot of black people really were the last people to ever give think a black guy could be elected president. You know. I mean, well, I, I think you you sh you saw the shift in polling after I once he once he became viable, then you then you saw I think a big movement in the African American community mm -hmm. towards Obama, but they had to, you know, they they had to be shown that he was actually electable. Well, I mean, two thousand eight versus two thousand sixteen, it Bernie Sanders followed the Barack Obama model, which was win those those uh, caucus states. But the one demographic he did not have right. were African American voters, mm -hmm. and, and he couldn't win the Deep South without African American voters. Yeah. Otherwise, Bernie Sanders probably would have won the nomination. It's I guess, possible. I mean, yeah. I woulda, coulda, shoulda. But <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, you're right. He did not do very well with African Americans, and um, you know, I, I read an article a few days ago though about how. Um, um, that may be changing. I saw that too. He, uh, he's doing a lot somebody of... Had somebody had followed him around Memphis, and then I think he went down to Jackson and met with the Mayor Jackson. Doing the Bobby Kennedy yeah. tour. You know, but he didn't... And, and again, I don't think it was a policy thing with him. I, I think he just didn't speak the language, you know? Um, sure. I mean, he didn't know how to talk about stuff like Black Lives Matter or... You know, or have the contacts, like you said. Yeah, because he's from Vermont. And, <laughs> you know... <laughs> There's some West Wing jokes in there yeah. about New England politicians, <laughs> but but on, on the on the Republican side, you know, I think we we've already established that it's probably a race for the number two position in the or, or to keep Casey Cagle in a runoff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably a three-way race between Brian Kemp, Hunter Hill, and Clay Tippins, who has money and a cool story. Um, an engaging backstory. He doesn't have as much money as people thought he did, though. Well, that's does you money matter? Disclosures. Anymore? Well, I, I did know, not. He, he. I don't want to get. He was. Meta, I mean, but, yeah. everybody had assumed he was going to put a bunch of his own money into the race, and he's. I, I don't even think he has a million dollars. Hmm. Hmm. Or he had like maybe a million dollar, but I don't know. He wasn't. That's he wasn't this super rich guy who can spend five million bucks on his own race. He's not, not Guy Milner. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big, or who was the guy who ran in? 2010, the guy from down in down in Bishop or something. What was his name? Oh, for um, who had all the money? He ran for governor. Just a random guy. God, anyway, I can't remember. Mm. <sighs> That's gonna be frustrating. Yeah, I'll we'll have to look that up later. Okay, um, we'll we'll look it up. Uh, there will be an addendum in, in the finding <laughs> aid. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I'd look it up. I turn my phone off so it wasn't while we're doing this. So. Well, I appreciate you, <laughs> but but you 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 mentioned. Um, uh, Secretary of State Brian Kemp in, in his rhetoric, tone, issues. Is that a conscious effort to reach beyond that Atlanta metro area where, you know, the sort of establishment of the Republican is sort yeah, of I think definitely. put the flag definitely. in South yeah. Georgia, Middle Georgia, rural Georgia? Right. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and it's... I mean, tactically, that's a, or strategically, I mean, I think that's a good move because when you look at who you're running against, you know, I mean, the Metro Atlanta vote between Hill and um, Cagle, I think, right. you know, is pretty much locked up, so you got to go somewhere else. And with North Georgia, with, with Casey Cagle being a Gainesville, Hall County, right. you know, North Georgia. Yeah, Gainesville Mafia. <laughs> and uh, and Hunter Hill's Buckhead, yeah, sort of the epicenter of Republicanism yeah. in Georgia. Although that's not true anymore. 
Um, no, I mean I think it's 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 North Georgia now. It's oh, not right. Even, it's not even North Metro the way that it used to. Oh be. yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's the mountains. Uh, Doug Collins's district, um, right. Congressman Doug Collins, and then yeah, Graves. Mm. Um, Tom yeah. Graves. And those are the two reddest districts in Georgia. I I believe Doug two Collins the is, the is the reddest in the country. Yeah, I might be wrong about that. It would, be Jody, it, red, it, it, it would be Jody. It would be Jody Heiss's were it not for Athens and the parts of Gwinnett, pretty much um, yeah. that it reaches into. Yeah, um, that's about a seventy-five percent Republican. Yeah, district. yeah. Um, which I mean, I think maybe Idaho. You might get Idaho maybe, go second. Maybe yeah, uh -huh. Wyoming, someplace like that. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, the at-large Wyoming race. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. R plus 33, I would say. Well, sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> we'll go with that. But you know, down ballot, um, the return of John Barrow, perhaps. Yes. Does, is that dependent on, like you said, what the top of the ticket showdown is sort of what, meshing what with? We, what we have seen, especially since 2010, is that 98% of people just vote straight party ticket. Didn't used to be that way. It didn't used to be is. that way, but it is now. It is now. And it's very rare that you see, um, you know, one guy differ more than maybe a couple of percentage points from another right. guy on the ballot who's in the same party. Like uh, in, in 2014, uh, Jason Carter ran two points behind Michelle Nunn. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody says, right. what, what, what is the late? And they ran Zelda. very different races. Yeah. But the result was almost identical. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see, because John is very much the centrist guy, and he has not changed. You know, he is running to the middle, and he is reaching out to those moderates, mm -hmm. who I don't know. I don't even. They they seem to be shrinking. I don't know if those people even exist anymore. But you know, he's if they're there, he's reaching out to them. <laughs> and so I mean, I think it'll especially if we have, uh, if Abrams wins the primary, which I think that she will. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how, because you'll you'll have a test case there. You yeah, know, you know who does better? Is there any significant difference between Abrams and Barrow? Um, and how are they going to get along? You know, I mean, it, yeah, the level of coordination. Between yeah, them. I don't know. And I mean, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be a good thing to have those two different messages out there. You know, maybe they can. You know, there's a question about whether you it's know that'll broaden in practice, broaden the tent, or they, you know, their their people just get mad at each other, and you know, there's a lot of infighting, which it's probably the likeliest outcome because we are talking about the Democratic Party, the circular firing squad. You oh, know, so. what was it the old Will Rogers? I, I don't belong to any organized political party. Right. I'm a Democrat. Yes. <laughs> we'll see if that still holds true. Yeah. So so closer to your bailiwick here in here in Athens. Nancy Denson is is term limited. Right. The entire commission is up for for election. Six seats. Six. Oh, who, who who's not running? Uh, it's well, it's it's half of the commission every. Isn't really. Every two years. Okay. Yeah. It, maybe it just feels like plus all, Harry Sims seat. It just feels like all twelve of it them are up. Like for, it, yes. Maybe that's it. Um, <laughs> I feel bad going into this line of questioning now, uh, but. The mayor's race uh, with with, with um, Commissioner Sims, Commissioner Gertz, and and Richie Knight. Yeah, um, sort of a late entrant. You know, he was the first one in. Was he really? Yeah. Wow. Officially. So his name will be on the first. His will be the first name. Because uh, no, I does it not go by? I thought uh, it was alphabetical. Qualifying. I think it's alphabetical. I guess I'll find out April 30th when early voting yeah. starts. <laughs> right. um, I can confirm this. Um, but you have two commissioners running, which is which is different from the the last couple election cycles where where Nancy mm -hmm. Denson was um, tax commissioner, tax commissioner and, and, and Spencer Fry and, and Gwen O'Looney. Yeah, was, Spencer was never 2010. been in politics. Right. And Gwen, of course, was the mayor back in the 90s. And then 2014 where you had the Denson versus Denson right. showdown. Yeah. Um, that was fun. We had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Right, right. But but handicap this race for me. You've got, you know, 
very different personalities and and, and somewhat different policies mm-hmm. at play. Um, well, the the conventional wisdom would probably be that you know Kelly's probably going to win. Um, I think the 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 big question is whether Richie does well enough to throw it into a runoff. I think. You know, I mean, with all the you know the revelations about his business and everything, I mean, that really ought to be disqualifying. Um, you know, so I can't see him really getting. Which you've the, you've made clear in other other forums of. Were you the guys that broke the the, the story, or was this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, and then the the red and black did a story too, um, but they came out about a week after mine. So you know, and they had some additional sources in theirs as well. So they push it along a little bit, but um, you know, I don't I don't see him breaking into double digits. You know, so I mean, I think I think the question is whether whether Kelly can get over fifty or whether we're all gonna have to go back, <laughs> go back in July. Oh. With with what nine percent turnout in the July runoff? Probably anything can happen at that point. You know? Right, right. So looking at the commission, I think when we were talking about a little bit about this before the camera was on, about the the sort of influx of the the quote unquote progressive community with Athens for Everyone um, alumni. Um, Tim Denson, the founders, running for a commission seat in five. five. Yeah. Um, Mariah Parker in, in two, right. um, Patrick Davenport, um, Melissa yeah. Link is sort of predated Athens for Everyone, but very much in that progressive yeah, right, right. Uh, mold. Yeah, um, and I don't, I don't think Patrick was really part of that, but I know that they've he's de- definitely him. right. Yeah, and, and there may be. Oh, I think oh, they're Tommy. St- I think they're staying out of the nine race. You know, Tommy's done some work with them in the past. But right. I think they're staying out of nine. But to- Tommy's a, Tommy Valentine is a yeah. very progressive yes. candidate right. um, for that part of Clark County. It, is is that a fair assessment? And Russell Edwards and Seth and of course Russ, been Russell really Edwards involved in that. Yeah. Um, going back to back when he challenged Paul Brown. Oh, right. Yeah. For. Uh, Back, back, back before Athens folks wrote in, it was a Charles Darwin. <laughs> right. Well, we had I remember that movement. It, but... um, <laughs> which, which I think says something about this election cycle yeah. where Democrats... You know, the actually... Charles Darwin story still to this day was, was the most clicked on thing that Flagpole has ever published. I, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a wonder it wasn't... It was picked up, I think, by... It was picked up by a lot of... MSNBC, lot of, yeah, I know, picked it up. News, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Paul Brown Jr. Um, that was, but but getting back to the the, the commission, yeah, you know, I think we talked about very early on in the the, the interview about development, and, and that being like the hot button issue. It is is that what this this campaign is breaking along those lines of development, or is it a more broad based progressive platform that these candidates? Uh- want to bring to bear? I think it's more broad based. I think um, the, the debate has really grown. You know, when I said the thing about development and growth, I mean, uh, the, traditionally, I think that's definitely been true. You know, sure. it still is to a certain extent, but I, th- I think it's expanded where now we're talking a lot about um, social issues. We're talking a lot about equity and, disc- equity and discrimination, social justice, um, things of that nature. And, and that uh, that is intertwined with issues of growth because you know, there's not necessarily been the investment in infrastructure in a lot of neighborhoods that there have been in others um, for those reasons, mm-hmm. uh, which is something we need to, um, we, we need to fix that. You know, and people, people are really starting to realize that now. Um, and that, so that's become a major issue. Yeah, one of the issues that I, I noticed when I first moved here about 10 years ago was Coney County, right across the line, you know, has marketed itself successfully um, as more business friendly. Right. Um, you know, the Epps Bridge Parkway development, yeah. and everything like that, sort of poaching the 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 what is it, the Atlanta Highway businesses uh-huh. over there. But I think, you know, do you get a sense that Oconee County now is more willing to grapple with the issues of smart growth and 
and restricting development in the way that, that Athens Clark County has been doing for years no. and years. No. 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 I don't think they've learned their lesson yet, you know, and they've done some really, really poor planning now in Coney County, um, you know, and they spent many, many millions of dollars in taxpayer money to build those roads to open up that land for development, and, you know, they did not plan property. They don't have the sewer capacity. Um, they don't have the fire protection. You know, there's a lot more that goes into being business friendly than just we have low taxes and like here you can build anything you want because our zoning code is super permissive. You know, that's not all there is to it. Um, you know, when you look at Clark County, there's, um, you know, we have a we have a great fire department. You know, we have um, lots of water and sewer uh, available, you know, things of that nature. And that all, I mean, that all factors into it too. And um, I think athens Clark County has made a lot of strides in terms of, you know, streamlining the permitting process you know, I mean, I really think this whole, like, Athens is not business friendly thing is really just a myth, you know. I mean, and I've talked to, in, in the, you know, the national chains, they don't differentiate between Athens and Oconee County. Um, you know, when Trader Joe's opened in Oconee County, they actually went to the planning department in Athens to pull permits because they didn't know that they weren't in Clark County. <laughs> they had no idea. You know, this, it just doesn't, you know, they're looking at a, you know, demographics of people and income, you know, within a certain radius, you know, they're not looking at county lines, you know, taxes to them is really just, I mean, that's a cost of doing business, you know, they're not going to move from one county to another. Especially considering to, where Trader Joe's is most prevalent in you know, right, yeah. affluent I mean, they have northern a, and western. <laughs> they have a clientele that they're going after, and it's probably more of a Clark County clientele than the Coney County clientele, but... You know, again, I mean, you wouldn't know the difference, um, you know, unless you were specifically looking for it. <laughs> so, and that kind of development, I mean, I just think that, you know, that's 90s style development, you know, that's not the future. Um, and I just don't think it's going to last. And I think they're going to have the same problems on their hands in 10 or 15 years that we have in terms of Atlanta Highway. Um, right. In terms of vacant space. and That are way You out. know, either someone is going to build another development further out that they're all going to move to, or you know, just the internet is going to kill them. I mean, yeah, I don't see, and people don't want to drive. They don't want to fight traffic, you know, especially young people. I mean, there have been studies done on this. Um, young people don't want to get in the car and drive. Uh, so, you know, increasingly, I just think these kind of developments are just really antiquated. Hmm. You know, and not good in the long run. Um, well, I, you know, the, the sort of development, um, I, I think that the, the, the real tension and I want to get your thoughts on it. in Athens is who not not so much will there be development but who is the development to, built to serve yeah you know in the downtown area for example you've got sort of the tension between oh my goodness a, a national chain there, there's there's a Waffle House downtown <laughs> Athens light your hair on fire right. um, yeah. Chick Fil A oh my god or or you know the the high-rise luxury apartment yeah. developments. How is that changing or going? I mean, it's a little early because these things have only been up yeah. three, two, three years, one right. year in the case of a couple of them. Uh -huh. But what's that going to do to to Athens? And it, it may be, you know, to your point of the popul student population is concentrated downtown now yeah, as opposed to the east side or right. wherever else we used to stick the students, <laughs> that many students. <laughs> yeah, east side, five points, yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely changed downtown. Um, you know, we've still, I guess, you know, the towny hipsters, we've still got our couple blocks over there on Hancock and Washington, um, but that's pretty much it. Um, you know, I mean, Townie downtown, downtown yeah. is really for, is for students and tourists now. Um, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these developers come in and, you know, and these uh, student apartments are extremely profitable because they're, uh, they're rented out by the bedroom. Right. So you can charge so four each, bedroom, kid, right? each kid a thousand dollars and you wind up getting 4,000 bucks for a four bedroom apartment. If you rented that to a family, you couldn't, you know, no one's going to pay that. <laughs> so, um, so they're very lucrative. You know, I, I think we're, I think we're about tapped out as far as that goes. 
Um, and now the trend, you know, and actually what I was working on before before I came over here uh, was a story about um, uh, somebody's doing an adaptive reuse project over at the old West, West Clocks plant. Wow. West um, Clocks. Yeah. That was the 1950s. I wrote an article about this. Okay. About the, the Athens boosters. That they were that was the industrial development park from the nineteen fifties, the, yeah. the the sort of early post war yeah. that that really changed open, Athens open in 54. from and changed the town yeah. from a mill town, university town into a, an honest to goodness diversified economy, uh -huh. which completely flatlined in the seventies and eighties. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have come back then because we actually have a pretty substantial. Uh, manufacturing base here. A lot of people don't know that, but, you know, we've got a carrier plant in Aramco, um, you know, a pharmaceutical company, you know, we got a lot of stuff out on, hmm. uh, out on like, like Athena Drive, Olympic Drive, yeah, you yeah, know, out yeah. there. It's not um, just breweries. No, yeah. Um, you know, but, but people don't see it, you know, it's kind of out of the way, but yeah, we've got a number of, not just Caterpillar, but a lot of plants over on the east side. But yeah, the West Clocks plant, so closed in 2000 and um, now, you know, somebody, and it's all, all these people are Atlanta people because nobody in Athens has any money to do this kind of thing. But, you know, that's part of the problem is they come in and they're from Atlanta, so they want to charge Atlanta rents and, you know, Atlanta prices, and nobody in Athens makes Atlanta money, so. <laughs> we can, we can um, vouch for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that that's the kind of thing that we're seeing a lot that's really geared towards, I guess, the grown-ups, you know. Um, you know, this is going to be, they're going to have a music menu, they're going to have restaurants, they're going to have, um, you know, shops and maker space. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's that kind of thing. And it's, you know, you're seeing that at Southern Mill, um, the uh, uh, the Chase Park Warehouses. I was, I was just, uh, you know, Tracy Street. That was yeah. really the first. Mm -hmm. You know, that was probably eight or ten years My ago. My wife and I attended birthing classes in, in one of those <laughs> studio spaces. Yeah, and you've got Athica over there, and you've got... Um, the it was right Press next door and, to Athica. Yeah. <laughs> so st stuff like that you're going to be seeing a lot of. Um, you already are, but I think you're going to see more of that. Um, you know, you've seen, you know, Five Points has really kind of caught fire. Normal mm -hmm. Town, obviously. Um, a lot of new businesses, bars and restaurants in Normal Town. Um, so you're seeing these kind of nodes spring up really outside of the downtown that are really um, replacing downtown in terms of being sort of the gathering spaces for the grown-ups, for the adults. You and we're seeding downtown to the students and the people <laughs> are in town for, you know, a convention at the Classic Center. And so hey. that's going to be like... That's going to be like the like the Bourbon Street, right? You know, in New Orleans, you know, we're like no one in, no one is from New Orleans goes to the French Quarter, you know. I mean, but <laughs> well, it, but it's, it's there. Yeah, you know, you, I always <laughs> joke the the the, the towny beachhead in downtown stops with with, with Joey and Emily, the, the Little Kings and Manhattan, yeah. and, and the it world used to famous. be Lumpkin Street, you know, people the khaki line, right, people right. called it, but now I think it's Hall. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. it's Hall. So we've lost we lost that block. <laughs> but yeah, you know, with um, but with 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 Bain getting write ups and national yeah. news, you know, that's going to yeah. bring them over to normal. Oh, and I mean, stuff. you know, the bottle works. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's another yeah. example. So now I think sort you almost have to look at it like yeah. like Cine and the National and the Forty Watt and like the bottle works really being sort of like you know almost a you have to divide up downtown that way. Where like you're it's gonna going, have to you're, you it's got, going further up Prince, you know, and then. The, what's traditionally right. downtown, that's the student side of downtown, I guess. I, I guess Flagpole's going to have to redraw the map that's been the same map since I moved to Athens <laughs> of all the neighborhoods and downtown yeah. and everything. Those lines are going to have to get redrawn. And that, and <laughs> so, so what, what, I'll get right on that. So, right? Yeah. Put it right to the top of the list. Uh, so so what's, what's next in terms of projects and everything for, for Blake, Blake Odd? You mean like what am I writing about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I can't tell you. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> It'll be dated. No, I mean, anyway. I got, I got a few. Right now, I'm just, I'm just trying to make it through May 22nd. You know, I've got, I've got like, a few. I've like got a the few, old I've politics got a few reporter. Kind of, I've always got a few sort of long-term, more investigative kind of projects on the back burner. So I'll probably get back okay. to those this summer. Um, one thing I really want to do is I want to take a look at ambulance response times. That's something I've been wanting hmm. to do for a while. You know, and I've gotten. I've gotten into it a little bit, but Interesting. You know, uh, there's a lot of numbers that need to be crunched. So maybe this summer I'll have time to do that. 
Well, it might affect that when somebody in the ambulance is saying, please don't take me to Piedmont. My, my insurance won't cover <laughs> they don't take my insurance. I'm, thing, I'm yeah. out of network. <laughs> Again, might be a dated reference by the time this is all, all posted <laughs> and loaded for posterity. But thank you very much, Blake. Um, all right. Really thank enjoyed you. it. Um, thank too. you for participating in the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia.